At this time, we'll call the October 2nd, 2017 Alexander County Board of Commissions meeting to order. Um, I will recognize Vice Chairman Ronnie Reese for the Pledge of Allegiance. We'll rise for that. And after the Pledge of Allegiance, for those that want to participate, we'll have a brief invocation. So please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let us pray. Lord Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, there have been many, many tragic <coughs> events in our country recently, and we only ask, we ask for your healing power, as only you can intervene. We ask that we bring unity to our country and we eliminate a divide. For our meeting tonight, we ask that you give us wisdom to make decisions out of the best interest of our county and our citizens. We ask that you put a hedge around those that protect us, our law enforcement, our EMS, and all the personnel of our county. Lord, we ask that you guide us and lead us in all that we do. Amen. 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 Okay, at this time, um, I'd like to recognize Mr. Ronnie Reese as we have a uh, special announcement here tonight. Uh, yes, Miss Judy Lale, if you'll come up and we'll make a presentation. Something to say, really? I hate to see you go, but I understand your retirement's a good thing. And I saw your family back there, so you'll have uh, a good time, I'd say. And uh, this is from a county commissioner, the plaque given to you. It says, Alexander County Board of Commissioners bestows the key to the county. I call him Judy S. Lale in recognition of 10 years of dedicated service to the Alexander County Board of Elections. Presented October the 2nd, 2017, and we appreciate what you've done for the county and appreciate your job and uh, you enjoy retirement. Thank you. And uh, we'll be glad to hear some words from you. Thanks okay. a lot. Thank you. Ronnie. Smile pretty. And Judy, at, with the members of your family at the end, we'd like for them to join you for a picture as well. Mr. Chairman and board members, thank you for your kind gesture and words. Public service is a special calling, and I feel honored to have served the voters of Alexander County for the past 10 and a half years at the Board of Elections, first as the deputy director and then as the director for the past four years. Alexander County is a beautiful place filled with many good, kind, and caring people. Our office staff is a small but talented group who work together in a cohesive unit Con to conduct all the elections in the county. Patrick Wyke has been the deputy director for four years and will be the new elections director. In fact, he was sworn in this morning. Our part-time staff has been Nancy Falk, Ruth Kalala, and Kathy Holler. This amazing group of people coordinated and worked as a team to provide seamless elections for the past four years. During that time, we opened two new satellite early voting locations. We are now one of 22 counties that has the newest certified voting equipment. We also merged several precincts and now deploy electronic poll books to all voting sites in order to offer better service to our voters. This staff's dedication to our elections process is to be highly commended. We have a three-member board, Nancy Sharp, Carl Lenz, and Martha Schrantz. These three people have provided support, advice, and the necessary overview of our office to reach timely certifications of every election. 
While their service may be overlooked by the public, it is a critical component of each election, and they too work as a team to get the job done. Other county staff have been very important in our successes. Many thanks goes to Greg Cronk and the IT staff, George Brown and Lisa Harrington, and Josh Mitchell and the maintenance staff. Their time and assistance have been invaluable. I'm really looking forward to this new phase in my life. I will always think of my time here with great fondness and wish you all the best in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Get a picture. Judy, a can we picture. get a picture with your family and you and the plaque and Ronnie? Yes, yeah. okay. Miss Judy, I didn't, know, I didn't hardly recognize you with your haircut. <laughs> My hair is a moving target. <laughs> I was like, I didn't know they said Judy Leon. I was like, where is she? Where is she? Well, well I don't I think Patrick you... and then I was like, I know she's back yes. there somewhere. Uh, Patrick and we have board members. All three board members are here. Uh, yes, we'd like the board members too, please. <clears throat> Nancy, Carl, Martha, would y'all please come up? Patrick. Patrick, please get included. Judy, you, you look too young to retire. <laughs> Good reason. Ah. <laughs> That'll do it. Mm -hmm. You want to get down first or you? We're gone. Oh, no. Yep. Yeah, just. I want to get you very bad. Come on, Mark. Very, very bad. This is good. Lord, you can't see her. Can you see her? There's no way you can see her. I was trying. <clears throat> I'm a blinker, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sure night, blink all you want to. <laughs> Did you get any with my eyes open? <laughs> 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 nope. I blinked again. Yeah. Maybe at time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. Okay, gentlemen, at this time we have commissioner's reports. Does anyone have anything to report? Mr. Chairman, I have a very brief. Um, Anthony Starr is here this evening to do a report. Um, he's the director of the Western People Council of Government. And I am, as county commissioners, we all have assignments, I guess you say, to committees and other extracurricular activities. Um, and anyway, um, I, I have the privilege of being the, um, the commissioner that serves on the West Pilgrim Council of Government Policy Board. And I say the privilege just because um, I've had the opportunity to learn quite a bit. And, when, when I became a county commissioner, first of all, I'd hear the term COG, and I was like, what's the COG? But um, I just wanted to say the, the Western Piedmont Council of Government, or COG, does a lot for Alexander County um, and our region. Um, and I think, as you'll see later tonight, when, uh, Mr. when Mr. Starr presents the uh, SEDS report, um, they do it. They do. They've compiled a lot of information, and are a major play. Are a major player in trying to move Alexander County, along with Catawba, Caldwell, and Burke counties forward. And um, I just wanted to mention, give the cog a thumbs up because uh, they do. They do a lot of good work. That's right. Yeah, Jim. Oh. Um, I'll just do this too. Um, just want to make sure everybody's aware. Uh, next Monday night, October the 9th, mm -hmm. um, we will have a joint meeting with the Alexander County Board of Education for future, essentially for some brainstorming 
um, short-term, long-term planning. Um, as you know. well as CVCC representatives. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. correct, yeah. And CVCC, hopefully, um, you know, in, in an attempt for all of us to Get all of together. us to, to get together and put our heads together and do the best we can for the citizens of the county, big and small. Yep. And that meeting will be at the Board of Education, just for point of information. Yep. Okay, nothing else. Uh, at this time, gentlemen, I'd entertain a motion to adopt our agenda as presented. Make a motion we adopt our agenda as presented. Do we have a motion? Do we have a second? Second. Do we have any discussion on this motion? Very none. All those in favor, please <coughs> raise your right hand. Those opposed, likewise. Okay. Uh, Madam Clerk, nobody signed up for public comment? Okay. Noted. Um, at this time, I'll recognize Patricia Baker uh, for a public hearing. Uh, call for capital projects, grant resolution, federal section 5310, enhance mobility of seniors and individuals with disabilities. And gentlemen, I guess we need a motion to go into public hearing. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we go into public hearing to discuss the enhanced mobility of seniors and individuals with disabilities. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on this motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your right hand. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, as you said, I'm Trish Baker. I'm the Director of um, Social Services. We are before you seeking approval to proceed with a grant, um, also known as the Federal Section 5310 grant. Um, this grant would be used to provide transportation services for individuals um, 60 and older, they would be able to go to nutrition sites, medical appointments, and um, obtain other essential daily living tasks through this uh, provision of transportation. Um, we did publish a notice of public hearing in the Taylorsville Times, and as of today, we have had no um, comment on that. Um, the grant we are proposing will be in the amount of $194,592. Of this, 10% will be our county match, which is $19,459. This is for next fiscal year, so we would, with your approval, include that in our budget request um, as we prepare our next year's um, budget. So um, I was here just a few months ago asking for a similar grant for this year. This will be to sustain us and get us through another fiscal year and so we're seeking your approval to proceed gentlemen any questions so this is really just a continuance of what you are already doing yes it would be um, working with greenway and to continue getting individuals to the nutrition sites and all the medical <coughs> appointments this would be for individuals who don't qualify for medicaid but don't have the means to get themselves okay. to transfer to providers okay thank you any other questions? Since it's a public hearing, anyone in the audience that has a question can certainly ask that at this time. Do the site transportation outside the county? Um, very limited. Uh, well, for medical appointments, yes, but nutrition sites are in the county. So, yes. Okay, good question. <coughs> okay, need a motion to approve or go close public hearing. Yes. <coughs> hmm. Okay, at this time I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Make a motion to close the public hearing for Federal Section 5310, Enhanced Mobility of Seniors. Second. A motion and a second. Is there any discussion on this motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of closing the public hearing, please raise your right hand. Those likewise. Opposed? <coughs> okay, at this time I guess we need approval. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, to apply for the grant for 5310, Enhanced Mobility of Seniors and Individuals with Disabilities. Would someone like to make that in the form of a motion? i make a motion to approve the uh, Enhanced <coughs> Mobility of Seniors and Individuals with Disabilities, Federal Section 5310. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. 
Motion and second. Okay, any discussion on this motion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed, likewise. Motion carries. Thank you very much, Trish. Thank you. You have a nice evening. You too. At this time, I'll recognize Zach Bright, who serves on our ABC Feasibility Committee. Good evening. My name is Zach Bryan. I'm the Vice Chair of the Alexander County ABC Feasibility Committee. Uh, we first met on the uh, 15th of August of this year um, as a group. Um, in attendance at that meeting was Ms. Laurie Lee from the North Carolina ABC uh, Commission, where she covered a variety of information regarding forming an ABC board, procedures, and economic thresholds involved in opening an ABC store. Uh, with the county having already voted for and passed the last, in the last re referendum the sale of alcohol through countywide ABC stores, Ms. Lee was clear with the community that the next step would be to hire an economic advisory agency to complete a feasibility study with the goal of being able to determine baseline data of similar communities um, with ABC stores, income, taxes, expenses, and profit uh, around those stores. Research retail information regarding leakage of liquor sales leaving the county. Uh, gather data from comparable locations to set a scope of the startup costs, location selection, and challenges of the operation. <clears throat> so over the course of subsequent meetings of the ABC Feasibility Committee, we contacted a couple of separate firms to give the committee their proposal and, and expense of conducting a feasibility study. Uh, those two were Western Piedmont Council of Governments and Creative and Economic Development Consulting were the two that both submitted proposals to our committee. Uh, from that information, the committee would like to propose that the county commissioners consider funding the Creative Economic Development Consulting Group for the purpose of carrying out a feasibility study. Uh, this proposal was based on, uh, from us, uh, the cost of the study of the quote was $11,600. The EDC in Alexander County has already worked with this agency in the past and is pleased with their work. We have some history with that. It's our, benefit, it's our belief that this information is a foundation that would be needed for decisions going forward uh, in regards to the past referendum of the countywide ABC stores. Uh, the deliverables would include a summary report containing startup costs, operation costs, sales revenue, and profitability. Uh, the creative team will present its finding to the Board of Commissions. Um, once green-lighted, the creative consulting feel that they would complete the scope within a work, the work uh, within the scope of 12 weeks. And it would be our request that the commissioners review this proposal and elect to fund the study. And I believe you have a copy. I don't know if you, everybody <clears throat> has one. So that's where we are. And I think by design, we do not have a commissioner that attends those feasibility studies because we want to remain independent and have them hear the right. same presentation from the state that we heard after it was passed. Right. And so, you know, we appreciate the, the group serving on that. Okay. Questions? Gentlemen? Well, I know, uh, uh, Mr. Brown, uh, <clears throat> the, we've got numbers like two different ones. So the, the number from the e Economic development, is that the one, the lower one, the 11-6? That's correct. That's just the first step, I would assume. For the that's the, well, that's from the creative development group was 11,006. Mm -hmm. uh, Western Piedmont, uh, COG was 13,256. Okay. So that's why we selected the creative development because of the expense. Um, the first step would be to do the feasibility, and then the next step, if we wanted to include them, would be to uh, ask them to help with the um, placement of the location, mm. demographics based around that, that'll be additional fee of about $5,000 if you choose to do that. Right. Got to find out the feasibility <clears throat> first sure. before you go to the location. Yeah. And Mr. Chairman, the, the approval of uh, this would be at the budget amendments. So, so the commissioners would not need to vote on this during the, at this time. We'll have the, when we do the budget amendments, we have a budget okay. amendment just for, okay. just for right. this. Okay. Um, Mr. Bryant, maybe you can help me. I don't always quite get it, I guess, but feasibility, what all does that entail? You know, if lo locations, not, not locations, part of feasibility, it's more, it's but what, more broader. Just purely um, the amount of potential sales? It'll look at potential sales within the county. It'll look at what's happening in surrounding counties. It's going to look at... Um, similar 
ABC stores within similar counties within the state to see how they operate, what their income is, what their profitability is. Demographics like right. ours. Yeah. And ultimately, it's probably going to derive whether or not we go the route of forming our own ABC board or partnering with somebody. Is that not really to, to mitigate the risk to your partner? Or does, does a study show that it can sustain itself independently? Yeah. Is that ultimately not? Yeah, I think, I think the first step is to, to do the feasibility study. So you've got actual data to work with. Second after that would be to form uh, an actual ABC commission. And then they would be tasked with finding the location and setting that up at that point. Any other questions? So we'll be done with the budget amendment. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Zach, right. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for serving on that committee. Yep. At this time, I'll recognize Mr. Anthony Starr from the Western Piedmont Council of Governments, the executive director. Thank you, Chairman Campbell and commissioners. I appreciate the opportunity to come speak to you tonight about the comprehensive economic development strategy. Um, this is uh, the, uh, I'll refer to it as SEDS going forward. Um, you sh all should have received uh, what is on the next slide here, a copy of the image, it looks like this with the, um, the report. And I'm just hope, uh, take a few minutes and hope to uh, uh, overview for you the contents of the plan and see any feedback you may have. I'll go into the next slide. So that's a copy of the strategy. You may note we had Rocky Face Park included in the, in the cover. We wanna make sure everyone was included as well. Go ahead. So as you may know, uh, the Western Piedmont Council of Governments, and for the benefit of our audience, um, as the commissioners know, we're a, a <clears throat> regional planning and economic and service agency. We're owned by the 28 local governments in Burke, Caldwell, Alexander, and Catawba counties. And one of the functions that we undertake on behalf of our local governments is we serve as the economic development district for the region as de designated by the e U.S. Economic Development Administration. And we're required to update uh, the SEDS every five years. And this provides a fr framework for how we spend our efforts on behalf of our local governments and also serves as a resource to our local governments. Next slide. Um, I'll point out that while there are many very good ideas in this SEDS, uh, it, we are just one part of the equation. Uh, certainly the Alexander EDC and many other organizations in our region, uh, the community colleges, uh, the local governments all play a part uh, in implementing it. And this committee was appointed by uh, our board uh, that we, uh, Mr. Lale serves on uh, as a fifth, appointed a 15 member SEDS committee in last November. It's a diverse group of committee members uh, that represent all kinds of walks from, of life from our region. Um, one of the thing that we focused on this time, as you remember us talking to you in previous meetings, is this loss of the age group between 18 and 45 year olds <clears throat> that we've all experienced throughout our region. And certainly Alexander County's not, not been immune to that. So the executive committee at the, at the Council of Governments wanted us to make sure that we included folks in that demographic in this planning process because if we were going to attract that part of uh, the demographic in the country and retain, retain those folks in our region and in our communities, then we needed to have them involved in developing the plan. So as a result, 75% of the committee was under the age of 50 and 50% of the committee was under age 40. Of course, it was split pretty evenly, male and female. All four counties were represented. <clears throat> There's a list of the committee members. I won't read those to you, but uh, they're there in the back of the plan as well. And you can see by looking at their affiliations that it's a pretty diverse group in terms of what they do for a living as well as their backgrounds. So why is it important? Well, we live in an era of economic transition. <coughs> we probably not experienced this much economic shifting since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, our economy functions on a regional basis. Uh, I'll show you the next slide here. It has a map that illustrates this quite well. You've probably seen this map before. This shows the daily commuting patterns uh, amongst our four counties. Each day, 42% of our workforce, of our, of our workers in our four counties, gets up in the morning and goes to work in a county different from the one in which they reside. Now, what does that mean? They don't really look at political boundaries. They really don't mean that much. Uh, they, we talk about it a lot. Those of us that work in local government, certainly you do. 
Uh, those, those things come up quite often for a uh, good reason, but the average person out there working in the average business, they're not thinking about those things quite as often. And our economy certainly functions on a regional basis. And you can see there, the larger the arrow, the, the, uh, the more traffic that is occurring in either direction from one county to another. Next slide. So we used quite a bit of public input through this process. Uh, in fact, we did an online survey that re received nearly 1,000 respondents. That's quite strong response. Um, and we used that throughout the process in identifying the issues and the strategies uh, for our region. Uh, I would say that each survey had several open-ended uh, questions, and that meant that we had literally six or 7,000 typed responses uh, to review. And we, we, we actually read through each of those more than once uh, and use that and summarize that for the committee and its deliberations to develop this plan. So uh, some of the things that came up, of course, education and training, health care. Uh, these are the opportunities that the public uh, sees. And now in some of these, these public in input, um, sometimes they can reflect reality and sometimes they reflect perceptions. And so that's part of the work that had to be done on some of this as we go through the plan. Uh, does your local government encourage small businesses to locate and grow in your community? 55% said yes. 28% said, said I don't know, and 16 or almost 17% said no. So what are we dealing with? Uh, you've seen this before. I came and spoke to the board last year about housing and population trends. Um, you can see that we've, seen, we've, we've actually lost population as a region over the last several years. It's no surprising with the number of jobs we've lost. You can see here on the far right, that circle, you can see our projected growth over the next 20 years in terms of population. It's very, very small. For Alexander County, that's only 3.3%. Not 3.3% each year, 3.3% over 20 years. So, that's pretty dismal. It's not really good numbers. However, let me say, that's just a projection. And a projection is simply taking current trends and carrying them forward. It doesn't mean that's what will actually play out. And if we're successful in implementing some of the strategies in the SEDS, I think we'll improve those numbers significantly over time. Here's another number that is kind of part of the profile that we went over with the committee and talking about them with talking with them about population and economic trends. You know this, you've experienced this. We lost over 40,000 jobs from the year 2000 to the year 2015. I'll note here on the manufacturing line, <coughs> um, you'll see that in 2000, 34% of our workforce was directly employed in manufacturing. At one point, that was almost 60% for our region. Uh, it's now down to 28%. You might say, well, maybe we've hit bottom. The reality is, is that perhaps we have, but maybe not. And the reason why I say that is the national average for uh, employment and manufacturing is only 9% for the average community. So if we're not aggressive in trying to maintain what we have and grow what we have, we still have ground to lose, a substantial amount of ground to lose. And so I'm not saying that we will, I'm just saying we shouldn't take that for granted. Next slide. So what has happened with our labor force? On this chart, you'll see the green bars represent the size of the labor force, those that are able and willing to work in our region. You can see that it's, it's, it's decreased over time. This is not unique to our region. Uh, baby boomers are retiring. Other folks dropped out of the workforce for a variety of reasons. But you can see that the labor force has uh, been uh, shrinking. In the last year, though, it actually started to increase again, so that's a positive sign. You can see in the blue, char blue bars, that's the number of actually employed persons. And so the difference between those two charts, or those two bars, I should say, is the unemployment rate. Uh, and you can see over time, most of our unemployment rate dropped because of the decrease in labor force. But in the last few years, we've actually experienced real growth in employment, and that's a positive trend. Next slide shows our unemployment rate here. Um, you can see in 2010, uh, it was 13.7% for our region. It was actually close to 17% at the peak right after the recession, 2007, 2008. Uh, and of course, it's down to 3.9% now. So as the committee did its work and studied these areas, it identified six 
subject areas that it came up with 25 different strategies. Those include economic development, workforce, infrastructure, housing, marketing, and community life or quality of life. Economic development is the first category I'll briefly cover. You can see here that we've, we've had positive in employment change in the last four years, 5.7% increase. That's positive. It's, it's, it's ahead of a number of regions of the 15 metropolitan areas. Um, we're better than average, but you can say, looking at that, we're certainly not the super hot markets that you might suspect are the typical characters like Raleigh and Wilmington and Charlotte and Chapel Hill, Durham area. Uh, it's not explosive growth like their experience, but it's, it's modest, uh, solid growth in the last few years. At the same time, we looked at poverty rates. Um, those are, of course, tied in with our, our job numbers. You can see here that since 2000, our poverty rates have increased. They peaked in 2010. They've started to drop down uh, for our for all ages and for, for overall population and for the under 18. But you can see here at our peak in 2010 and still almost that at 22.3%, almost one in four children in our, in our region live below the poverty line. So one of the recommendations they, uh, that the SEDS committee came up with was the construction of shell buildings. Of course, Alexander County has been a leader in this respect. You had a successful announcement a few months ago with that. I think more of that is needed. Uh, one of our counties did a study uh, on economic development uh, activity, and they determined that 80% of last year, 80% of the requests that came down from prospective businesses were for shell buildings that were ready to go or almost ready to go between 50 and 100,000 square feet. And we have almost no inventory in our region meeting that criteria. Now, and, and, and this can be done a number of ways, certainly like you did here with the, the railroad corporation uh, was a successful model. Catawba County's got a different way. I think Caldwell's entertaining starting the same program and what the committee said is we ought to have, here's a couple of pictures of some of them, uh, one that's under construction in Claremont, of course the one here in, in Taylorsville, um, the, uh, is that we ought to have one in the planning stages one under construction and one available at all times for our region if we're going to be successful because otherwise uh, if we don't have the product available uh, then then we're not going to be successful in that way and one might say well is this the role of local government i don't know perhaps perhaps not that's a that's above my pay grade i can tell you that it's like many years ago when when certainly rick uh, you go back 20 years earlier in our careers um, economic development involved maybe just providing cash incentives. Maybe it just had the zoning, then it became you got to have the zoning in place, and then you got to have the water and sewer to the site, and then you got to have the, sat, uh, the site graded. Now they want you to have the building ready. It's just we don't get to choose the market conditions, but those are the market conditions we find ourselves in if we want to be competitive. So another one is uh, it deals with the staffing capacity we have at the COG. Frankly, right now we're stretched quite thin as far as economic development grant writing and administration goes. We've added a new person this month, a new position, um, and so uh, we, we want to keep and maintain that on your behalf. Uh, building reuse grants have been quite successful. We want to keep momentum going in that direction, and then of course. Uh, the Manufacturing Solutions Center right down the road in Conover has been a tremendous asset for our region as well as the Engineering Technology Center and the new uh, campus for uh, Morganton campus for the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics. Uh, if, you're not, if you're not aware of that, that's a huge win for our region. It may not be located in Alexander County, but it's, it's going to be tremendously uh, uh, successful for our region and bring a lot of highly educated uh, faculty into the region as well as bringing in uh, the best and brightest students in our state and they're gonna they're gonna call part of their childhood home here as a residential high school and uh, they've selected uh, their uh, their site at our next mayor managers meeting which will actually be here in Taylorsville coming up later this month we'll actually have uh, the director for the Morganton campus come and give us an update and show you the plans that they have for the site they've selected it to be on the eastern ridge of the North Carolina School for the Deaf there in Morganton workforce uh, 
is another category. Uh, like <coughs> you saw the chart there, those are, uh, we have real and perceived issues. We have interest gaps, we have skill gaps, we have challenges that many communities are experiencing. And this is probably one of those areas where our efforts will give us a competitive advantage if we figure out how to best use our limited resources. Uh, so a couple of public input. Uh, how well does your community work to maintain a skilled workforce? 43% said adequate. Uh, another 57% said poor or good. 16% uh, so said good and 35% said poor. Do you believe there are gaps in educational resources? Almost half said yes. Educational attainment still matters. Um, we talk a lot about the value of college education. These uh, statistics here are for people in our region, age 25 and above, according to their education level. You'll see there as the education levels increase, the income increases as well. There's a curious uh, anomaly there that you'll note is that those with some or some college or associate's degrees actually have less income than those with only a high school uh, graduate uh, attainment level. Well, you wonder why that might be. Our, our theory is this, is that uh, a higher percentage of our baby boomers have only a higher uh, high school education or equivalent. And many of our younger workers have some college or associate's degree. The baby boomers are at the end of their career at where they're high, earning the most in their career usually. And whereas our younger population, it tends to be a little bit more educated with, and that's national trends that hold true for our area, they're early in their career, their earning potential is less because they have less experience. As I think, I think that's what explains. It's not big, mu that much of a difference, but, it, but it's, it's worth noting. Question on it. Do you think the leakage of our younger workforce, if you compared those same levels to say Charlotte, Mecklenburg, or Raleigh, or Wilmington, I'd assume those wages would be up. It, would that be something y'all think is part of that leakage of the young? Yeah, I think that very well could be a contributing factor because um, as younger folks have education, and if there's not job opportunities where they're from, uh, either they won't return from college or they'll leave once they get educated. And we've certainly seen that with our out-migration patterns. We've lost with the recession that we experienced uh, in 2008. Uh, we saw a great uh, uh, outflow of population, uh, and those tended to be those that were economically and, uh, and educated folks who were mobile uh, and can move out and uh, tended to be more educated, more affluent parts of our population. So infrastructure is another category. Uh, of course, economic development is greatly uh, influenced by that and it's a condition of being successful with our economic development recruitment efforts. Next slide. Uh, it's one of the areas that we focus a lot of our attention on your behalf um, at the Council of Governments. Last year, we were successful in re receiving $10 million in grants for 30 different projects that leveraged an additional $75 million in private investment and almost 300 jobs. So uh, what do we need to do regarding infrastructure? Well, transit-oriented development uh, in our rural areas, maybe this isn't as important, but certainly in our urban areas, that's an important aspect. Uh, prospective employers are asking about this now. Um, bicycle and pedestrian networks, trails, parks, all tied in, tie in with that. Fixed route transportation, public transportation is also important uh, to, to extend that and have that operating in as many municipalities as possible in our region. Um, I'll note that many of the national companies that come looking for sites here, they really don't think about the historical stigma that we have with busing here in the South. Uh, so that they look at that as an asset, not a liability or a negative thing. Uh, continuing with infrastructure, uh, we, John Marshall, our, our planning director, and his staff work really hard on this front with serving as your, your MPO, your Metropolitan Planning Organization, responsible for transportation planning in the region. And we try to real hard about being smart about how we submit our transportation projects for Alexander County and our other communities to make sure that they're in a way that is competitive and we get our projects funded as soon as possible. It's a very data-driven process now with DOT, uh, and so it's, it's pretty sophisticated. And so we work real hard about trying to get our projects. And sometimes that means dividing up uh, projects. I know like Highway 16, uh, doing some pavement widening and shoulder improvements and, 
and other uh, safety improvements along the entire corridor of Alexander County is one of the road projects. We recent, at our last meeting earlier um, last week, uh, we decided to break that into two projects because we feel like the southern segment of 16 will score better and we'll have a chance of getting the project funded sooner than if we left the whole 16 corridor and as one project from all the way from Wilkes County to Catawba County, for example. Healthy housing market is also key. You, you, last year I spoke to you at depth about this. You know the, the differences, the decreases in home ownership rates that we've experienced, but also the increases in vacant housing. Uh, we've seen our vacant housing nearly double uh, to 13.7%. About half of that 13.7% or a little over uh, 10,000 homes in our region are just sitting there. They're not for rent, they're not for sale. They're not vacation homes or seasonal homes. Um, and how does that play into things? Well, housing construction is a big part of any local community's uh, uh, economy. And unfortunately, we got a couple of uh, statistics there that reflect poorly on our region. And it's, it's directly related to our job situation, I believe, over the last 15, 20 years. And so we've had, uh, of, of the 15 metro areas in the state, uh, we, have had, we have the highest percentage of housing constructed before 1980. Why is that important? Well, we know that after you get to that nearing that 40 year age, which it is, that maintenance becomes really important about whether a home is still uh, viable and uh, a problem for a neighborhood or a community. And so you start seeing a lot more maintenance problems that really drag down property values. In addition, we've also, out of those 15 metro areas, we're ranked number 15 in terms of number of new homes constructed since the year 2000, which is last. We don't like to see that. It's a problem we need to work on. And there's a conversations going on in the region, both we have established a vacant housing task force to look at this issue about the vacant homes at the same time. We have all these vacant homes, but we also need new homes constructed because the homes that we do have are, is, is not what the, 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 the population is seeking oftentimes, and Commissioner Lell knows this very well from his profession. Housing, uh, so we're gonna keep working on reducing the number of vacant homes. There's a variety of reasons why they're vacant. Um, mother or father could have passed away, and the family hasn't done anything with a home. Uh, the, the, the homeowner might have lost their jobs, might have lost their jobs in their home and moved out. Uh, uh, it was in the process of foreclosure. Maybe the bank hasn't followed through on that. It may be just sitting there. It may be in the bank's name. It may not, uh, but it's not on the market to get it turned over to someone else. So there's a couple of common things. How does this affect us? Well, all these things are affecting that 18 to 45-year-old age demographic. Of the 15 metro areas, you can see here, between 2000 and 2015, we lost 22.5% <coughs> of the population in that age range. Um, that's the worst in the state. Uh, that's a reflection of the large number of manufacturing jobs that we lost. And so we need to turn that around. Certainly there's some uh, peculiar uh, regions in the state that, that have that. You say, well, why is Jacksonville so high? Well, what's in Jacksonville? Camp Lejeune. Camp Lejeune. So theirs is very much tied to the military de deployments uh, ending and uh, folks coming, uh, soldiers of uh, Marines, I should say, coming back home. So they've seen big increases there. Uh, other areas, Raleigh, all those universities there, uh, Wilmington's at the beach. Uh, there's, a, there's a variety of reasons why each region has seen success or decline in that category. This one shows the population trends the, as, I, as I showed before. Uh, over the next 20 years, uh, if all trends continue, uh, Alexander County won't lose population, but it won't see much gain uh, if, if things don't change. So uh, marketing is a key component that we talked a lot about with the SEDS committee. We have really, uh, it occurs to me, four different audiences. We have prospective businesses, prospective residents, people that don't live here or work here that we want to attract. But then we also have our current residents and our current businesses. And frankly, there's a negative narrative out there. We have a lot of positive att attributes for our counties and our region and we need to figure out some strategies to improve our own perception because if, we, if our own residents don't feel good about what we have here, then it's gonna be really hard to attract new, new residents and new businesses. And so that's something that needs to be taken on uh, in, 
uh, in addition to that, you think about the assets that Alexander County has. When a person chooses to live here, you've got tremendous uh, assets. You've got beautiful views here. You've got Rocky Face Park, other amenities and services here. But you also have Catawba County, and you have Caldwell County, and you have festivals in other towns. And so, uh, although you got great festivals in Taylorsville here with the Apple Festival and so on, uh, people also travel to Valdez for a festival, or Lenore. And so we ought to count and capture those things, whether it's Wilson's Creek in Caldwell County or whatever. Um, people get to take advantage of that wherever they happen to live in our region, and we, and we ought to promote that because our assets together as a region are much stronger than, it are, than they are as individual counties. Community life or quality of life is the, is the other category. Um, uh, we need to, uh, you know, Part of what came through in the discussions from the SEDS committee with it being a variety of people from a variety of backgrounds of walk of life was the encompass opportunities for public participation in the decision making process. You know, I've been doing, I've been working in local government myself for 22 years now, and I can tell you there's, there's people talk a lot about, well, you know, town hall doesn't listen or the county commissioners don't listen. And the reality is, you know, that almost every agenda, you've got some sort of public input or public hearing. And I, I've watched too many times where one person show up to a public meeting and turn the direction of the entire board. And so they're certainly welcome that public input. I, I feel like almost all of our elected officials welcome public input. But we've got to be uh, smart about how we reach out and make sure everyone feels like they at least have the opportunity, whether they take advantage of that opportunity or not. Um, Downtown revitalization is a, is a key term. Uh, some of the most successful areas in our state and in our community involve strong, robust downtowns. It's an attractive part of recruiting uh, uh, new businesses. And new businesses today aren't just asking about what's your, what your cash incentives, what's your infrastructure, what's the site and grading costs going to be. They're also asking, do I want my employees to live in your community? And that's a key change that's really happened in the last 10 years. And that's turned uh, a lot of what we're doing with economic development on its head. And we have to rethink about some of our priorities and making sure that um, our communities are as desirable as possible because it will affect the businesses that we try to recruit to come to our region. Next slide. Um, we're, a diverse, we're as diverse now as a region as we've ever been, 87% white, 7.1% African American, 7% Hispanic, and 3.2% Asian. Interesting note there, very shortly uh, for our region, his, the Hispanic population will become the largest minority group for our region. Next slide. Uh, we're also growing older. We have a lot of baby boomers that are moving up in age. You can see here in the last 15 years, we've experienced a 56% increase in folks in, uh, age 65 to 74, a 30% increase from folks aged 75 to 84, and 44% increase in people living uh, older than 85. So what does that mean? Well, there's a lot of positive opportunities with that in terms of attracting retirees and all the talent and assets that these folks bring and their time to, ta to donate their time and volunteer for our communities. But it also means significant service requirements and challenges for our local governments, whether that be EMS and other types of medical care and facilities. So it's both positive and challenges that we're gonna have to address with, with that happening. And that's not unique to our region or to Alexander County as well. Anthony, how does that relate to the 3.3% growth that we're going to, that we're projected to experience? Right. So that, that's a really good observation, uh, uh, Commissioner, that, that, that we're, while we're losing younger population, we're experiencing older population increases. And so uh, that means we're losing labor force potentially for the future. And uh, you got two opposite directions happening there at the same time with our population. We're getting older because the people we already have that are here are getting older by staying in place while those mobile younger people are leaving and we're, or we're not retaining them, bringing them back when, when they graduate college. It seems to be more of a shift than, you know, than, grow, than growth or it, it, it is both. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a shift in terms of the population we have, baby boomers being, uh, you know, 
well, they're not as big as the millennial generation any longer, but they were for a long time, and they're get and the baby boomers are getting older, so they're staying in place and they're getting older. So our population, as an average, is getting older, uh, and we're not bringing in as many young people. There's a lot of national trends on that front as well. So this is all relative. Everyone's experiencing that, but you want a more healthy balance in terms of what we're experiencing. But seeing the numbers as they are, then you would be wise to look at things that serve the elder right. people. Yeah, and that exactly. I think that's that's the point. They bring a lot of resources with them and time and talent, but they also we our senior service centers, our area agency on aging that the COG operates on your behalf with Meals on Wheels funding and home respite care, family caregiver support. Those are all services that are going to see increasing demands on 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 that funding and those services that as that population gets older. I guess on the other hand, you would see the need for younger services such as school systems, possibly the continued declining population, which creates another set of... Right. I mean, you're going to spend one way or the other. It's, it yeah, I mean, uh, you're not the only county that's seen declines in student population in the public school system. Um, and so that brings its own set of challenges. And so we have these buildings and this capacity and these budgets that we have to support uh, and you know much of our funding is tied to the student population sizes in our school system and so it's, if, as, that, as that declines so do our revenues from the state um, uh, but those facility costs and overhead costs don't decline and so I think that's why retaining more of that 18 to 45 year old age group will help in that respect by uh, you know best utilizing the, the school capacity that we already have in terms of physical structures. So um, I'll skip over this slide here just for time's sake. Um, one other thing I want to mention, you know, compared to most of our boards, you're quite young uh, in our region. And um, a number, and, and so th said often about this, group. Th th this, this is a challenge that frankly that we have now because um, we know we look at the demographics of our elected leaders throughout the region and we know that we're there's going to be a lot of change over the next several years as a result of that. And so, we have <coughs> the sets committee said, What are we doing to cultivate those next leaders? Are we grooming people that might serve on our various committees that might serve in elected? capacity? Are we being intentional about uh, getting them ready? You all know that the first time you came on as an elected official, it was probably drinking water out of a fire hose for a while. Well, we, can, we can help that curve, that learning curve with them if we're intentional about uh, grooming folks to serve on our elected official boards and other appointed positions in our, in our, in our, throughout our communities. And so we have to think about succession planning. Who, who's the next in line, perhaps? Um, and I say that because some of our local governments struggle to get anyone to even file for open positions. I can tell you, one of our, one of our municipalities, this, with the current election, no one filed for an open seat. No one. So what does that mean? There won't be an election for that seat. And after the election, the council's going to have to appoint someone to fill that seat. Um, and so you want more than that for all of our communities. Um, create robust downtowns, as I mentioned before, is an important aspect as well. So, next slide. Healthy living uh, initiatives. Uh, there's a lot more interest in outdoor activities and recreation opportunities. And of course, uh, you know, you know the issues with opioid abuse and illicit drug use and how it is impacting our region particularly. Uh, this is not a health or criminal justice study, but the SETS committee felt like it was important to acknowledge that issue because it does have economic impacts for our region. So, Right now we're going through presentations. This is actually the first day that I've started presentations uh, uh, of the SETS since uh, our board adopted it last Tuesday. Uh, so at this time, I'll be glad to answer any questions. If there's particular groups you'd like me to present this information to down the road, please let me know. So I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you for your time tonight as well. Questions? I'm just a lot of good information, and uh, it's kind of hard to really take it all in at one time. But I appreciate the work y'all have done on it and you know, being involved with the COGS. So, uh, 
and what you said there, kind of the end, I'm on the Bio Health uh, Committee also. And the opioids is really, you know, that's something that we really need to be looking at pretty hard because it is driving and going to continue to drive a lot of cost. So, sure, but definitely appreciate your work on this. And well, thank you for your ongoing support for the Council of Governments. We, we, we uh, often say this, we're not some separate organization. We are an extension of you and your staff and your resources. And so we appreciate the support you, you show to us. And, and uh, we were always eager to provide the best value to you in everything that we do. So please uh, call me if you have any questions about this or in any other way that we can help you. So. Well, I, I know you've been helpful. I know in, in our, sometimes in our business does, we'll seek data and trends when we're trying to evaluate something. And your group and your team are very good to give us traffic counts and information like this that help you make a better decision. So I want to say thank you for that. Thank you. Oh, and I have, if anybody in the audience would like copies, I have extra copies of the plan if you'd like to take a copy tonight. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Starr. At this time, um, I'll recognize Ms. Allison Brown, North Carolina Cooperative Extension Presentations, and this has to do with agriculture in Alexander County, and I think it's rather startling <coughs> to understand the economic impact it has in Alexander mm -hmm. County. Yes, sir, thank you. Uh, I am Allison Brown, and I was born and raised here in Alexander County, went off to college, come back here to work, and raise my family, so I think it's a great place to live and work. And I'm very passionate about agriculture. I grew up on a farm here in Alexander County, continue to live on a farm today and operate a farm. That's one of the points I enjoyed your presentation. I couldn't catch on the committee if there was an agriculture person representing agriculture on your committee because that's a very strong part of our community here in our county involvement and our, the money coming into Alexander County. So, um, but that's just something I'm very passionate about and it's a, it's a huge part of Alexander County is our agriculture. So next slide, please. So some of the things I do in my work, um, I love my job. I get to have a lot of fun and uh, I get to work with a lot of different people. And so these are some of the things that um, I get to work and teach kids about. So I wanted to see if, if you could recognize any of these things. One of the centers meet. It, it is. <laughs> Very good. Well, it well. is. Be Do you know the particular cut? That's something the kids have to identify. It's actually skirt steak. Okay, so if you eat fajitas, it's in, in those. It's skirt steak. Um, I was going to say that, but you didn't give me a chance. Oh, man. So sorry. So sorry. I was going to say number 12 is an ear, ear piercer. Yeah. It's an ear tagger. It oh. is. So that we can, so we can um, identify our cattle, our livestock, so that we know uh, if they get out or, or get missing, we can be able to identify them. And also for uh, cattlemen to be able to keep records because they have to do keep records and, and have reports as well. And then, of course, on the, your, the left is that is a feed that we feed our cattle, and that's barley. So the, I work with kids and a, a group and that we study these things, and they learn a lot. And these are all things that are used on farms here in, in Alexander County or a product of farms here in Alexander County. So on the next page, you'll see one of our success stories. This is a group of kids that I've worked with um, for several years now, the older ones anyway, the younger ones just this last year. They uh, participated in the state junior uh, quiz bowl and skillathon competition and placed third in both competitions in the state. So we're really proud of that. These kids have a lot of knowledge in their head. And um, Clay actually placed fifth overall out of all the individuals in the competition. So just a great group of kids that are really interested in agriculture and just a good product of our future. And if you know that Alexander County is strong in livestock production and we rank 13th in beef cattle production and fifth in dairy production. In 2015, livestock, dairy, and poultry had cash receipts of 180, over $188 million. And that put our county our county size only ranks 88th out of all the counties in, in North Carolina in land area. And that put us in ninth place for the state in ag income. So that's a significant amount of money. Um, investing in our youth and agriculture for the future of Alexander County. And that's what I hope that I'm being a part of. Next. Um, Alexander County. 
uh, Cooperative Extension along with the Alexander County Soil and Water. We wrote a grant to work together um, to be able to purchase a weed wiper for um, the folks in Alexander County, the agriculturalists, to be able to use. We also partnered with the Alexander County Cattlemen's Association to find the rest of the money to suit, uh, to fulfill this cost. Um, this will help our producers be able to control weeds on their farms uh, with much less chemical use and uh, be a reduced cost to them in their overall budget. So that's, we're glad to be able to do that, um, but more friendly on the environment and the pocketbook. So that's what we're looking for. How does a weed wiper work? Yeah, oh, work. well, that's very interesting. So we put the chemical in the container, the tank that you see there, and then there's a roller, like a kind of like a roll of carpet, like a carpet drum, and the chemical soaks into the carpet, and then you drive it along, and it hits the top of the weeds, and it hits this chemical. The substance soaks into the weed, and then the weed takes in the chemical, and the plant will die. It'll target the ones we want. So you can either use a broadleaf chemical in there to kill broadleafs, or if you want to kill everything, like in between orchard passes and things like that, you can, of course, use Roundup to kill everything. But you don't have any overspray on No, and you know, now we have so much more problems with, um, with volatilization of chemicals, especially in the summertime with the heat and things. And for instance, at my farm, I have some tobacco planted right behind me. So I can't just spray whatever I want to because on a hot day, if that volatilizes, it means move up into the air and then goes over and sits down on that tobacco, well, I would be responsible for it. So we would like to not have to pay for that. So this is a much better way for us to be more economical and purposeful in our spraying and be able to control it. So we're proud to be able to offer that uh, to be for farmers to be able to rent out and use because we currently do not have one available here in the county. Okay, Foothills Forge Tour. Um, last year we started our first Foothills Forge Tour. We hosted the first one. We have a lot of progressive farmers here in our county. Forage, of course, is the main base diet for um, cattle and livestock here in the county. So we were happy to be able to showcase what other farmers are doing. And uh, they're, you know, they're very progressive. Um, so we were able to highlight two stops last year here in the county. And then this year, Wilkes County hosted it. So we were able to go up there and see what those farmers up there have been doing. So we were seeing, last year we saw some crabgrass. Yes, we actually purposely plant some crabgrass. It's a very good source of summer forage for our cattle to eat. And then this summer we went and seen a farm that uh, plants uh, Bermuda grass. So I guess we purposely plant that too. So um, that was good for us, the farmers, to be able to see and get ideas. Because farmers have some really good ideas. So it's good to get, share those ideas and get them from other folks. So... That's what I've had going on and got going on. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to come and share and you know, keep agriculture on the forefront and in your mind. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Allison. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next, we have family and consumer. And I, I will mispronounce your name. Is it Durr? Yeah, you got it perfectly. Durr the way Holcomb. I always say is say under, take out the un, and it's Durr. <laughs> My last name is a lot easier to pronounce. Let me introduce myself. So I'm Dur Holcomb. I'm the new Family Consumer Science Agent for the North Carolina Cooperative Extension Services here in Alexander County. And um, I started back in March. And so thank you so much for just giving me this opportunity just to kind of present what I've been doing um, during that time to now. Thanks. Next. Yeah. The first program I wanted to share with you is just uh, what I've been doing with the Taylorsville Learning Center. Uh, Lenny and I have been working back in about March with about 14 kids on teaching them how to garden and how, how to harvest those vegetables. And we taught them, as you can see the picture right there, um, they grew some vegetables in our raised beds in, in the back of the office. And we also brought harvested some of those vegetables, brought them back in, and taught them how to cook them as well, too. We made a little kale salad and let them taste test spinach as well, too. Um, I also went with and worked with them as well too on a nutrition program where the students learn how to properly wash their hands and uh, parts the different components of my plates. As you can see in the picture, we also made some freezer, some strawberry freezer jams. Next. 
The next thing I want to share with you is Catawba River Farm School, which is part of the North Carolina Farm School. Um, the goal of North Carolina Farm School is to allow a pathway of success for farmers to generate profitable business businesses. And what they did is it's a seven, seven month long program, but it has eight business sessions and six field days. Uh, the business sessions focus on different areas of developing a business plan from financial management to defective marketing strategies. The field days are led by innovative farmers um, and agricultural participants, and these were some of the pictures that we took from the different farms. Um, I should mention as well, too, that the Catawba River Farm School is actually um, an area program, so it's Catawba, Alexander, um, Gaston, Lincoln, and it's farmers from all those areas as well. We had a total of 23 participants this year, and in our pre-evaluation of those 23 participants, we found out that 91% uh, of them have never written a business plan, 95% has no experience with marketing, balance sheets, income statements, cash flow, and enterprise budget. Um, when we asked about their confidence in writing a general business plan, 77% felt moderately confident in writing a business plan. We had um, t a total of 14 who graduated from this program, and in order to consider, be considered as a North Carolina Farm School graduate, you need to complete 80% of the homework that we give out, as well as, or, I'm sorry, or complete 50% of a business plan. And so we had 14 who graduated. Of those graduated, 83% um, said they felt very confident in writing a business plan, and 75% stated that they found new market opportunities as a result of North Carolina Farm School. Next. The next program I want to share with you is just a Healthy Living series, and it is a three-part series in partnership with the Plants for Human Health Institute in Kannapolis. Because of some issues, we had to shorten it down from a three program to a two program instead, and we just finished it last Tuesday. We had a total of 14 participants, and the program taught our participants about inflammation, prebiotics, probiotics, micronutrients, macronutrients, and synergistic eats. Um, our evaluation showed that 90% of the participants in attendance are actually not consuming their recommended daily uh, intake of fruits and vegetables. And so upon the completion of the program, when we evaluated them again, 100% of them said that they plan to eat more fruits and vegetables, about 25% more of what they're actually currently consuming right now. During the workshop, the participants were able to taste test some of the recipes that um, the Plants for Human Health Institute develop. Um, and they plan to make at least one of those recipes. You can see in that image right there, I know it looks weird, but it's actually a blueberry salsa, and it was actually very, very tasty as well. Um, and that was one of the ones that they really enjoyed, along with a mango walnut, walnut tart as well. Next slide. Uh, just some extra programming efforts that we did this year. Uh, we had two uh, pressure canning lid testing, and that was actually hosted out at True Value in their parking lot where it was open to the public to come and bring their Dow Gauge pressure canning lid to be tested. We, uh, it, I also partnered with Catawba to put on a school garden train the trainer where we share different school garden um, curriculums with teachers, volunteers, and other educators within the Foothills areas as well too. We're still in the process of evaluating how successful we've been and whether anyone's adopted the curriculum that we shared. The other thing that I'm working with Lenny on is a farm to uh, child care program with the Partnership for Children as well as Lulu's Enrichment Center. And so one of the things I've done so far is gone out to Lulu's and train the teacher kind of on some different things they can do. One of them was making uh, different types of salad dressing. What I was told was that a lot of the students had just dipped their vegetables that they harvest from the garden outside and ranch. And so these are just some tastier, healthier options for the kids to try out. Next. And the last thing I just want to share is just some of the uh, upcoming programs. Uh, we have a Preserving the Harvest workshop coming up. We actually have our first one starting tomorrow, and it's on basic canning as well. And some of the other ones that we're doing is on um, jams and jellies, uh, dehydration, and pickling and fermentation. The other thing is we are finish we are starting a new um, program, nutrition program with the Learning Center at Taylorsville Elementary, and we're actually going to use the Try Healthy curriculum from NCA and T State University to um, implement with them on nutrition. Uh, safe plates. So safe plates is uh, very similar to Surf Safe, if you heard of that. That's for the Certified Food Protection Manager program here, like the different restaurants. And so instead of doing Surf Safe, we'll be doing safe plates. Safe plates is actually developed by um, NC State, and so what we're doing is basically just uh, very 
similar to that, just a different um, organization that published the curriculum. Last thing we have is Speedway to Healthy that is coming November the 14th and 15th, and um, it's the exhibit, and third graders will be able to go through the whole human body and kind of uh, gain some stuff from that as well. And we are still looking for volunteers, so if you commissioners want to join in and have a little fun with us that day, you're more than welcome to attend as well, too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. This time I'll recognize Christy Krause, 4 H and Youth. Hi, I am Christy Krause with the Alexander um, Cooperative Extension 4 H agent. Um, some summertime is a very busy time for 4 H, so just some highlights of opportunities that you've had this summer. Um, there was a clover bud camp that's for youth ages five to nine, and they went several different <clears throat> places. They went to Rocky Face, they went to Suncrest Water Park, they traveled to Zootastic Animal Park, the Statesville Fitness Center to do some indoor rock climbing, and um, the Statesville Leisure Pool. They went to the Science Center one day and did some activities. Another uh, program that we had um, was Farm to Fork. And in Farm to Fork, the youth go out and they learn how food goes from the farm to your table. So we went out to local farms each day and they uh, picked vegetables and fruits. And then they came back to the Extension Center and they learned how to cook and make something with that and then take the recipes home. We also had kids in the kitchen. With kids in the kitchen, the youth are learning basic cooking skills and food safety skills. Um, this year, the theme was foods from around the world. So they learned foods from different countries and recipes and their culture um, as they went to kids in the kitchen. Next. Another opportunity is 4-H Congress, and 4-H Congress was held in Raleigh. It was held July 29th through August 1st. Uh, over 500 youth from North Carolina attend, and they um, have activities for leadership, for citizenship, um, service opportunities. And for Alexander County, Sarah Perry and Annabeth Harris represented us. Um, and Sarah Perry was actually inducted into the 4-H Honor Club, which is one of the highest honors um, a 4-H'er can achieve. So they were tapped in during the candlelight service on that Saturday night. And next. Other activities we had were STEM Day. STEM, of course, uh, stands for our science, technology, engineering, and math. So they had a day where they had hands-on activities. Um, we also had 4H2O. 4H2O camp was all week, and it uh, dealt with water and related environmental issues. They went canoeing, they went to several creeks, and they tested the water and learned about um, those environmental issues. Discovery Days, we partner with Caldwell and Catawba County, and we go and discover each county. So we went to Divine Farms um, in Catawba County, we went to Tuttle State Park, and then we went to Rocky Face here in Alexander. Um, so summertime's always very busy for 4-H, um, and those are just a few of the, the camps we had. Now starting off we have, now that school started, we have our after school programs. And so after school, go once a month to the following um, elementary schools, Stony Point, Ellendale, Taylorsville, Sugarloaf, and Wittenberg. And so we'll go do um, our after school program for them. Also partnering with the communities and schools doing reading partners. So I will go to Ellendale, Wittenberg, and Hidden Night each week and work with their reading partners program. And Ellendale and Hidden Night also have a Leader in Me program and they have uh, a time of their day um, where they have clubs and groups to individualize for the students. So I will also go there and have a 4-H club for those interested in 4-H during those schools. But I appreciate all your support for 4-H and our youth. Thank you, Thank you Christy. Thank you. Last but not least, I'll recognize Mr. Lenny Rogers, director, who will talk about horticulture. Okay. First of all, I just want to thank you for letting us all give an update <coughs> to our department. And we are a staff of five, and you've seen three. I'm four, and the only one missing is Julie Campbell, our administrative assistant. And I just want to share, uh, as far as the way our agency is funded, <clears throat> we're half funded by the county, half funded by NC State University, as in, as is 
extension in all other 100 counties in the state. Okay, I just want to sh uh, share a little bit on my, my program areas. Uh, one of those in horticulture that I deal with is uh, Master Gardeners. I teach the Master Gardener program in our county. And in the past years, we've done that with Caldwell County. And uh, <clears throat> we do uh, basically 12 weeks, 40 hours of instruction. And if they want to be a certified Master Gardener, uh, they have to return 40 hours of service to the community. So that's in all phases. Um, diseases, insects, pruning, whatever. Next. And we do some outside activities with them as well. You know, pruning, uh, propagation, torn a few uh, gardens, things of that nature. Okay, next. Uh, one thing I did help with this year is uh, the Hazardous Household Waste Day we do in the county. Um, we also, in conjunction with that, do a pesticide uh, collection day, unwanted un uh, old pesticides, and we took in about 700 pounds of unwanted pesticides this year there. Next. Another thing we work with is the community gardens in the county. Um, our master gardeners actually have constructed these. Uh, this is the one that's down behind the mobile home park uh, below Town Hall baseball field. And there is uh, 16 beds there. Uh, next. You can see they can hold a lot of uh, produce in those beds. And they're rented out to individuals for $15 each. This is the community garden at the high school. <coughs> um, and there's 20 beds there. And the community can rent those as well. Uh, and the high school students use some of those beds. And we're looking at putting another uh, community garden in at Northwood, up near Northwoods Park, the townhouse and property, and wants to put one in there. This just shows a little demonstration went in at one of our apple growers. There's a strip, actually, and look at the next strip picture. It's sunflowers. See how big they got? Next. And the reason we planted that is because they uh, draw in uh, the brown marmorated stink bugs. So, uh, the grower can lure them into that area and then spray them. That's a little uh, demonstrate research project we did there. Next, uh, this is a little. How effective was that? So-so, not the greatest. We'd it does draw them in, but not as well as we would have liked to have seen. But that's only one particular variety of sunflower, the gigantuous. Uh, they tend to do a better job than uh, the smaller sunflowers. Where can we get some of those? You can order them <laughs> online. We can help you get some. Like a project. Yeah. Uh, this is a demonstration at the Farmer's Daughter. This is rhubarb. Uh, this is plants we've got from the research station. We're doing a, a field demonstration there on that. And last slide I've got here is just as of, a, of our farmer's market, and it's been located there in the old hospital lot. Um, you know, in the future, I know we're moving into the new building in the future somewhere uptown near the park. We'd, we'd love to find a new location for this farmer's market, uh, just to give you something to think on. Um, we usually run the market from mid-June to on into September and we just like to get a little bit away from the yard sellers there and get a more clean family market so just looking for a better spot just throwing that out there a uh, couple other things I just wanted to mention while I'm here um, in the past uh, we've had an area poultry agent to serve the poultry growers in our in our county and uh, we re they recently have a hired one. Um, it's Lauren Green. She's going to be housed in Wilkesboro, and she's serving our area along with several other counties. But we're one of the larger counties she's serving. That used to be paid for uh, uh, roughly a third or a fifth by our county, but that's all. That position is now totally state state funded. Just wanted to mention that. But there's <coughs> someone in that the old Kathy Button position that used to run that. Um, I do want to mention uh, there is a grower request for an area tree fruit agent. Uh, I've shared that letter with Rick. Um, about uh, several years ago, we, uh, Bill Hanlon uh, served, we paid about a fifth of his salary to serve as a tree fruit agent for our county. And he became the county director in Wilkes County and continued to do some of those duties, put it on a winter tree fruit school, uh, do a lot of scab and coddling moth predictability reports and things for the growers. But he just retired, and uh, they replaced that position just with a general horticulture agent. So there really is no expertise for the tree fruit growers. So Perry Lowe the uh, third, along with the apple, uh, I know the deals had a little bit of input, drafted a letter from the apple growers requesting some funding. And the university's looking at that. I just want to let you know that that's out there and the request for some of the growers. I don't know where that's going to go. But uh, uh, I do want to say I we appreciate you incorporating us into the new building that's being designed. And uh, the uh, 
office and kitchen space uh, seems good, very adequate. The meeting, new meeting room looks good. Um, we're looking forward to working closer with some other departments in that building. And uh, one of our only concerns is storage, and I know that's kind of tied in there. So uh, just I know there was a, some talk about some possible outside storage and some of that, so I just encourage the county to look at trying to develop that too along the outside of that building. And um, I just want to thank you again for your support, and uh, we're proud to serve the youth, the families, and the agriculture com community in Alexander County. Any questions? Questions, gentlemen. Good thank, report. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you Thanks. Lanny. Thanks, guys. At this time, I'll recognize County Manager Rick French. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we need to schedule a public hearing at Stony Point Elementary School on either October 23rd or October 24th uh, at 6 p.m. The reason is for we're going to apply for a CDBG sewer grant for uh, Stony Point Elementary School, and we'll need to have the public hearing there. Uh, if we stay with our Monday trend, October 23rd would be sort of follow our Monday meeting meetings for October. And if you're going to do that, we need a motion um, to set that date. Monday and time. Is it on Monday? It's a Monday or Tuesday. I see you checking your calendars. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I'm fine either way. Monday's Monday. good. If we want to keep our Mondays, that's Let's just go. That Let's do that. So we need a motion that affects so make a motion that we schedule public hearing for Stony Point Elementary School on October the 23rd I have a motion do I have a second second motion and a second is there any discussion about this motion Hearing none all those in favor of the motion raise your right hand opposed likewise motion carries uh, also, Rick French, Budget Ordinance Amendments number 12 through number 18. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, budget Amendment number 12 is the budget for the estimated cost of a feasibility study related to uh, a potential new uh, ABC store. That's the feasibility study that we had talked about uh, in Alexander County. We had originally budgeted the 13.5. Um, we did that budget amendment some time back, but whatever money we spend, if we go with the lower, which is what the recommendation is, it would just be, it would fall in that budget amendment. So, and that budget, uh, that request, I think is 11.6 for that um, agency. Budget amendment number 13 is the budget for a temporary part-time position in soil and water office during the maternity leave of the department head. Budget amendment 14 is to increase the health department uh, budget for additional WIC and STD prevention funds and to increase the health department budget for Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina Foundation grant, the health telemedicine funds. Budget amendment number 15 is to decrease the health department budget, the state reduce healthy mother, healthy children due to the NC session, North Carolina session law 2017-57, Senate Bill 257. This resulted in a pro, uh, appropriating a significant portion of the maternal and child health block grant to special projects causing a lack of funds for the healthy mother children, uh, healthy children uh, programs. Budget amendment number 16 is to amend the county water and sewer annual budget for estimated cost for engineering contract to prepare and submit the engineering report to the state division of water infrastructure by December 1st, 2017 for the water line extension project and budget amendment number 17 is to increase the Bethlehem Sewer Fund annual budget for estimated cost of engineering contract to prepare and submit the engineering report to the State Division of Water Infrastructure by December 1st, 2017 for the sewer collection line extension and pump station upgrade project. That's for the Bethlehem Sewer. The new sales tax uh, that can be used for economic development, public education, and community college uh, began in fiscal year 217. The county general fund transfer to the Bethlehem sewer fund is being taken from the new sales tax that was received in 2017 that's in fund balance. Uh, budget amendment number 18 is to budget for general fund local match for the Borealis Compounds Industrial uh, Rail Project. The new sales tax, Article 44, 
uh, that can be used for economic development, public education, and community college began in fiscal year 2000 2017. The county match amount is being taken from the new sales tax that was received in fiscal year 2017. And then you have a budget uh, project ordinance, um, Borealis Compounds Industrial Park. Uh, it's for 500,000 is revenues, and those revenues are broken down by NC DOT Rail Division, 175,000, NC Railroad Company, 225,000, Alexander Railroad Company, 50,000, Alexander County Government, 50,000, which is, relates to the budget amendment you, uh, I mentioned earlier, and the expenditures are construction of a road uh, for that and um, engineering and inspection fees. Uh, which also totals $500,000. And I'll be glad to try to answer any questions about all any of the, all those, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Mm -hmm. uh, questions? Well, uh, Mr. French, just one question, and I kind of think I know the answer anyway. The <coughs> budget amendment number 12. Yes, sir. That's something with the ABC and the feasibility that Mr. Bryant you know, has already approached us with. Yes. And I was yes, looking sir. here, it shows uh, 67000 $250 roughly. That is money that came in from the alcohol excise tax. Is that right? No, that, no, sir. That's just what's budgeted for in governing body and professional and technical services. Okay. But it's money that came well, from... That's the, that's the... That is not... Uh, that's just the expenditure side of it. There's a revenue side of okay. it. Okay. There okay. were funds received there, there was over year. that much. Yes, sir. How much were roughly? For 60000 So the 60... Roughly 60000 yes, I just... Yeah, and that's where basically this money is coming from. Yes, sir. That from the alcohol that yes. passed all that's the way correct. Yes, sir. All right. Thanks. Okay, so to, as my dad would use a, I'm not a very good hunter term, <clears throat> cripple it and let it run by me again. Um, just to, I'll say, just to make this as clear as mud, basically, the expense for the um, study is coming. I'll say the feasibility study. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I mean, comes out of I mean, comes out of has to come come from the budget. It comes but out. But there the is there has been excise tax that's winning. that has been that's right. that the county has received. That's correct. Mm -hmm. From ABC. All, I'll say uh, up until this point already. <coughs> yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Um, that would that was only that is that was received because of the passage yes sir of ABC referendum that's correct correct okay. that's correct so long story short just to um, so I guess my question and this is more informational than actually a question because I think I know the answer but so there in essence, has been money added to the budget that has been received right. from the state of North Carolina through the ABC, you know, ABC division, the board, whatever you want to call it, um, that exceeds the amount of this expected expenditure. Well, the, you have a you have expense and a revenue. The expense you already had you have a expenditure uh, in the Governing body, you have that line on professional and technical services. Well, sure, yeah, but I'm, then, but I'm, I'm and just then talking the about the revenue I'm, comes from fund balance. That's where it goes. Yes, right. sir. But exactly I mean, I'm right. just saying of the thirteen thousand, you know, the that's right. I mean, we're essentially approving a thirteen thousand five hundred dollar budget amendment. You are to cover the the feasibility study. That's the correct. feasibility study, or you know, to, or essentially to pay an outside entity to provide the information that the. Um, the ABC Feasibility Committee needs to that's be right. able to do their job. That's correct. Yes, sir. And bas so basically, I, that was all I was trying to say. Okay. Is there, yes, sir. Is there's money that has come in from the from the state in the form of excise tax that was only re that was only received because the ABC referendum passed mm -hmm. at the pre at the last election. Yes, sir. So That's it's correct. paying for its own well, stuff. Yeah, that, yeah. I Basically, think it's, in layman's term, we could say that the alcohol is paying for the alcohol. Okay. Basically. That's, yes, sir. Okay. Can I make, clarify this? Because I'm on ABC. 
pass in the referendum be shared in the distribution of the excise tax? And what we, we received, $63,963.61. That is based on population, uh, not based on anything that has been sold. And that is reported as of June the 30th of each year. And we were only in the, um, since the referendum passed in November, we actually did not receive a full year, so we can be increased. Thank you very much. That's very good information to know. It has nothing to do with sales. It has to do with population. 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 For any county municipality that has passed. Yeah. Right. That has passed. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So really, and, and I and I didn't mean yeah, I, I didn't mean confuse. That's, that's mm -hmm. what I was trying to to it's, get out there was okay. that uh, it's basically you know it's funding itself really. Plus, Plus some. Mm -hmm. Any other question on these budget amendments? Do we need to do the 12 through 18 and the other ones? No, sir. You, can, you, can bless, you can vote them all at once. So if somebody wants to vote differently, well, they can just indicate yes, one. Yes, Okay. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Okay, gentlemen. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the budget amendments as presented? Make a motion to approve budget amendments 12, 13. 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. And do I need to approve the ordinance sitting yes, sir. Or and yes, sir. plus ordinance number uh, P1 for Borealis for the project ordinance? Make that inform the motion. Yeah, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. A motion and a second. Is there any further discussion on these budget amendments? Well, I'd just like to say with Borealis and Mr. Starr gave us information about infrastructure, shell buildings and those things. And boy, I think in Alexander County, we're right on top of, of you know, keeping up with those things. So I hope we continue to move forward. Okay, any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of Budgets Amendment 12 through 18 and the Ordinance P1, please raise your right hand. Those opposed, likewise. Okay. Uh, at this time, I'll recognize Rick French, County Manager on Other Business, County Manager's Report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, what's being passed down is the sales tax uh, information uh, through September, which is basically one month of sales tax with our sales taxes run, run behind. Um, in regular sales tax taxes, we have collected $398,573, which is 8.75% uh, of the budget collected. Uh, we've gone through 8.33% of the budget year. We budgeted $4,556,000. We are 4.29% uh, ahead of the same time last year. The new sales tax uh, that's show, shown is $120,923.68. It's 8.64% um, of the budget collected. Uh, the year ex has expired is 8.33. We budgeted $1,399,000. And that's 7.32% uh, ahead. And so I just want to mention that. Uh, in the information that I passed out to you in the county manager's report, uh, there is some information um, that I would like to point something out. Uh, with the, um, you have in your information the attached estimated debt service for both water and sewer uh, that we've been talking about. As we're all aware, we've started the process um, to, for over $10 million of water and sewer. Um, state loan for sewer, we have the estimated payments. The rate is we have 1.9%, 3 million of that 5.1 million is at zero interest loan. 
Um, those payments will be made for that debt service will be made with the new sales tax. Uh, we also have the water. Uh, uh, again, that's the estimated debt service for the water system and the water total funds is you have that information is four point nine four million nine hundred seventy one thousand three hundred thirty five dollars. It has some zero three million zero interest and one million nine hundred seventy one thousand three hundred thirty five dollars at one point nine one percent. And I just wanted to show you again. This is I think we provide that information before what the uh, principal payment principal that the payment and interest were for those items, which was for the interest and the principal uh, for the term of that. Um, loan and again it's a loan um, and I have some other things Mr. Chairman but I have a couple things for closed session but I, that's unless you have any questions that's what I'll give my report tonight. Any that's questions it. gentlemen? Mr. Prince can I ask you one question about the water and sewer? So yes sir. I, this is another one I think I know the answers. Okay. But um, to this point property tax has never been spent yes. to provide water or sewer. That's right. Yes, in sir. Alexander County. That's correct. I just wanted to make that I just wanted to make that fact known. And we are early, early, early in the process with these both these loans, so we haven't received any funds. We, you know, we're um, quite a ways out before we'll start getting in, in that part of the process, but the actual construction was actually a couple, probably a couple years out. But, and but we I, and started the, the planning process. The re reason I wanted to make that point is, as one of the one of the um, one of the guys that's that I guess is on the subcommittee that's looking at this a little, you know, a little deeper. Um, we ha we've had the conversation that. Um, it is much, it is always more fair for the people that use something to pay for it. And there are people in Alexander County that don't have access to county water and probably never will. And you know, and we and that's one thing that made me feel really good when I um, when I heard you know, when I heard that the you know the water systems in Alexander County to this point have, you know, have managed to be enterprise systems and pay for themselves. Um, now those of us with Hickory City Water or, you know, County Water or Energy United Water or whatever you want to call it, we're not always thrilled with our, what our bills are. But it's part of it. Um, I have city water, so I pay for city water, mm -hmm. and. That's one of those things, and I just wanted to make comment. Um, I know that I feel sure the other commissioners have had people say to them, I don't even have city water at my house, or I don't even have county water. And we wish, you know, we wish that we could take it, that there was a way to, um, and I think I'm speaking for everybody, that we could, we could offer it to everybody that lives in Alexander County, but obviously that's not possible. And, um, but I did want to make the point that the folks that use it pay for it. The folks that don't use it don't. That's correct. Okay, any other discussion? No, sir. Uh, at this time, I'd entertain a motion uh, to accept the consent agenda as presented. <coughs> I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Uh, second. Any discussion? Hearing none, those in favor of approval of the consent agenda, please raise your right hand. All right, this time I would entertain a motion that we go into closed session, North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11A45 and 6, Economic Development, Contractual and Personnel, and we will only re-adjourn for adjournment only. I think I said that right. We will only reconvene. 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 Sorry. Close oh, enough. We know what you meant. We'll only come back to leave. Yeah. <laughs> and that's you make our... that as a motion, correct? No, I will oh. consider that somebody <laughs> make a motion, but correct my. Yeah. Motion? Yeah, I'll make a motion to go into closed session with the whatever number. Yeah. I lost my paper. Yeah, the number for the closed session. We've seen it enough times. 
Yes. We should know it by heart, but I can't remember all. Second. <laughs> Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, raise your right hand. Sorry. All right.